Hello and welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. I'm Robert Bryce. On this podcast, we talk about energy, power, innovation, and politics. And I'm happy to introduce my guest, Nick DeUlius. He is the CEO of CNX Resources Corporation. Nick, welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. Hey, Robert. It's great to be with you. Thanks for having me. So, Nick, I warned you, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself. Uh, this is the custom on, uh, on this podcast, and uh, uh, I've given your title, but I'm, I'm sure if you have a other, few other things that you want to talk about, uh, if, imagine you've arrived at a, at a dinner party and you have a, a, a 45 seconds or a minute to introduce yourself, go. Yeah, again, as you said, I'm an official capacity, the, the CEO, president of CNX Resources, uh, which is a company that's a natural gas producer, one of the largest in the Appalachian Basin, Marcellus, Utica Shales. Uh, we also operate our midstream pipeline infrastructure, but at heart, you know, beyond the, uh, the official capacity, I'm a Western Pennsylvania guy, a Pittsburgher, lifelong, lived my entire life uh, in the region, and really had the chance to, to observe a complete uh, metamorphosis of the region from what it was, which was classical manufacturing and and energy uh, went through a big downturn. It was very painful uh, for, for many in the region. I experienced that through my childhood and, and young adult life, and now saw sort of this uh, resurrection of traditional manufacturing and energy, largely brought about uh, by the natural gas revolution. So it's, it's been a, an interesting journey as a lifelong Western Pennsylvanian and Pittsburgher to see that. Okay, well, great. That's so, um, and, and I know CNX, I wanna talk about the Marcellus, but. Well, tell me, you, you, you gave me a bit about the CNX. Uh, and I, I looked up uh, your, your market caps about three and a half billion dollars. So you're not a you're not among the biggest. You're a, you're a mid sized gas producer. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, our focus has always been exactly that, uh, not necessarily looking at scale or, or production uh, level or, or ranking with respect to that, but, but more importantly, how impactful uh, our footprint and our operations are. So our attention has always been on things like being a low-cost producer uh, within the basin, which is the low-cost basin of natural gas in the United States, uh, being the highest margin producer, and being able to put forth uh, what we call a sustainable business model. A lot of talk about sustainability uh, these days in, in different circles and stakeholder groups, but defining sustainable from a business perspective is one uh, that can demonstrate profitable and efficient operations under any sort of part of the uh, the commodity cycle. Sure. And you have about 400 employees. Is that right? I'm remembering off the top of my head. Yeah, we're somewhere in the 450 range and probably a uh, thousand to, to 2,500 contractors at, at any given time in the field. Okay. So one of the things I know that, uh, well, I want to talk to you about is how, what you mentioned it briefly in your in your in, in your introduction, your, your, where you introduced yourself. How the, when I want to talk about how the Marcellus Shale and the Shale Revolution changed Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania economy, what it means more broadly for the U.S. economy, and then I want to talk about the you know the broader outlook for natural gas because there's a big push now, as you know, to electrify everything. There's a big push to ban natural gas, and, and it's underway in California and other states. Uh, but let's start with the Marcellus Shale. Uh, 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 Rick Smead, who's now with RBN Energy, once called the Marcellus Prudhoe Bay under Pittsburgh, which I thought was a pretty interesting uh, uh, description. How how important has the Marcellus been to Pennsylvania as as a whole and to the Pittsburgh area specifically? Absolutely fundamental and, and vital. Uh, I refer to it often half jokingly, unfortunately, because there's a lot of truth to it is the greatest story never told. And uh, what you've seen, whether it's the Marcellus, specifically here in Appalachia and Western Pennsylvania, the Pittsburgh area, or whether it's just natural gas and the shale revolution throughout the United States, you basically have seen the exemplar, classic textbook case of innovative and disruptive technology at play. So we've seen this story play out with Henry Ford and the manufacturing line. We've seen it play out with microchips, and software, and social media platforms, all kinds of different technologies. But here we are in what was primarily an old line industry. And you saw American innovation, ingenuity brought to bear where we always knew that the methane was in, in sort of enclosed in the, uh, the shale deposits, but the technology didn't exist to basically liberate it at efficient and prolific rates where you'd have an economic rate of return. And drilling technologies, completion technologies, 
through trial and error. And as I said, the free market sort of bringing those, uh, those experiences and technologies to bear, found a way to do that. And once that was achieved and it could be demonstrated on a replicable, consistent basis, everything fundamentally changed. And you've seen a change and evolve from the very local to the, the macro geopolitical. So if you look at Western Pennsylvania on the local side of things, uh, you talk about the middle class and the, the need to sustain and, and grow the middle class. This has been the single biggest contributor to bringing back the middle class to the core of this region since the steel industry. And that was decades and decades ago. Uh, so you see that with respect to just the, the family sustaining wages that the industry brings to bear. I've just used my uh, company as an example, the all-in compensation package for the average employee across the company. When you add in 401k and benefits and the rest is somewhere around $150,000 per year. Uh, that's not an outlier with respect to this industry. That's fairly common throughout the space. And you've also seen it with respect to a resurrection of manufacturing. So whether it's Shell uh, with their announcement of building a petrochemical cracker facility uh, just outside of Pittsburgh, that's because of where that sits, literally right on top of a very reliable, prolific uh, source of their feedstock uh, items and, and energy and, and materials. Uh, so so let me interrupt you there just to make that clear. So you're talking about Royal Dutch Shell and a recent, yes. their shell, the U.S. arm of, of, of Royal Dutch building is an ethylene cracker. Is that the, is that the, the plant that you're talking, you're referring to? Yep. And, and, and uh, in round terms, what's that investment that, 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 that Shell is making in Shell is making in shale gas in the region? What's the, what's the round numbers? What's that investment? It's a great uh, microcosm of this virtuous circle. So what you've seen is billions of dollars of investment in the aggregate, but you saw each cycle of the investment chain come to bear. So you saw the initial construction phase of this, where literally thousands of building trades employees throughout the region are, are working there to construct the facility itself. Uh, you're going to see, of course, the longer term permanent job positions with respect to running and maintaining the facility, but then the most important and exciting phase of this, I think, is still yet to come, which will be all the downstream manufacturing and advanced manufacturing that's going to come into play, where they are going to want to locate those facilities close to their feedstock, which would be uh, what the cracker facility is, is producing. So you've seen it from you know, the development I'm of- Just interrupt there, Nick. I'm, I'm, I'm good at interrupting. That's one of the sure. features of this podcast. But so they're going to they're going to take shell will take the the the, the methane from Marcellus and then produce plastic products right and then so you're you're talking about the downstream of that plant will be plastic manufacturers or people that will use that to make uh, to make uh, consumer goods is that right Exactly so when you're looking at uh, whether or not you want to build something like a petrochemical cracker facility one of the most important inputs is what is the cost and the supply going to be of ethane, sort of one of the, the primary feedstocks of that, that endeavor. And locating that plant on top of uh, one of the most prolific locations for ethane production over the long haul, which is the Appalachian Basin and in Western Pennsylvania, Northern West Virginia, Eastern Ohio, uh, that became a big rate of return driver for the location of that facility. And then, as you said, once that facility is installed, when it starts to produce its products uh, for the plastics industry, et cetera, and its polymers, then the downstream manufacturing facilities that look to utilize that and to convert it into something else uh, along the supply chain and the value chain, they're going to want to locate those facilities as close as they can uh, to their primary feeds. So it's this, it's this another example, another cycle of how location and proximity to reliable, affordable energy production is an absolute driver of regional economies that then creates uh, offshoot opportunities for, for other economies close by. So when you're talking about ethane, just to, for people listening, so ethane is a natural gas liquid, like propane, like butane, uh, xylene, what there are eight of them, right? The the, the light ends is, uh, so they're produced in, 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 I guess they're a byproduct of gas production and a byproduct of oil production as well, but then they're used in petrochemicals. Some are used directly like propane, but Ethane is much more of a, a chemical feedstock then. Is that, is that right? Right. So the Marcellus and Utica fields uh, that we have in Appalachia, some of them produce exclusively methane, natural gas, and some of the horizons or the, uh, the geographic surface area also produces what we call the wetter gas, which will include ethane, propane, butane, et cetera. And uh, both of those areas of the footprint or the place, so to speak, 
uh, offer very low cost and replicable uh, supply sources for years and decades to come. Thus, okay. so when you produce, you're... And, and so when you're producing wet gas, you strip out those liquids because you, you want to sell those, and that's not what we. I'm not going to get propane in my in my burner tip and my on my stove here. That's not going to that that's not helpful to me or the. It's not good for the system, right? You don't want to put that kind of gas into the pipeline. Is that right? Exactly. Not not good for the system with respect to natural gas for home heating and electricity generation, but very useful uh, for other manufacturing or uh, energy utilization efforts like like the cracker facilities. So the cracker facilities feed off of that. That's their feedstock, whereas the uh, the natural gas system for home heating or for electricity generation prefers not to have it in the system because of uh, the need to want uh, exclusively methane CH4. Sure. Okay, so let me let me play a little devil's advocate. I'm you know I'm pro natural gas. I'm pro nuclear. I'm pro energy. Pro human. But somebody listening to this will okay. So he's got Nick DeUlius on the on the and, and DeUlius is just going to talk his book, right? He's CNX CEO and he's talking about his hometown. And I understand that argument, right? How would if I was to pose that to you? Well, you're just talking your book. You know, you're talking. You're you're promoting your company. How would you respond to that? I'd go back to the facts, the science, and the engineering of how our world and our economy works. Um, so the, the way I would phrase that or respond to that would be that if you think about a, a typical worker or company in the Appalachian Basin today uh, that is in the natural gas industry, when they go to work each day to liberate the methane molecule, um, whether you're working in the industry or not, there are going to be inevitable and substantial consequences of that, and they're going to be positive. So what do I mean by that? Um, one consequence is going to be that that methane molecule may end up staying within this region and being utilized within this region. So an example of that uh, would be the electricity grid, which largely uh, saw a conversion from a coal-based electricity grid not long ago in this region to one that's natural gas-based. That's reduced uh, the cost of electricity, that's improved the reliability, and it's improved the air quality as well as the CO2 footprint. It's reduced the, the carbon dioxide footprint of the region and the state substantially. So if you're a ratepayer, which is everyone, it doesn't matter if you're a small business owner or a large manufacturer or a, uh, a homeowner or no matter what uh, socioeconomic uh, level you, you sit in. In fact, I would argue more impactful, right, for, for middle class and, and uh, in the poorer communities, that's been a huge benefit from environmental quality to the cost of affordability of homes. Um, but there are other sort of other consequences to that. You look at the United States broadly, uh, Southeast United States as an example, has basically retooled their economy to feed off of Appalachian natural gas. And you see that in everything from pipeline projects uh, that have been constructed or being built to get that molecule from Appalachia down to the Southeast United States to what's going on with capitalization and capital investment in those economies in the Carolinas and the Southeast, again, to, to basically feed off of the low cost and, and reliable natural gas that we're producing. You've also seen it globally. When you look at LNG, liquefied natural gas, and what it's doing, uh, or the ethane that we're producing that we spoke about earlier, uh, we talked about the ethane being utilized at the cracker in Pennsylvania outside of Pittsburgh that's being built, but ethane and natural gas produced here is being deployed and shipped to everywhere in the case of ethane, uh, to Scotland and Norway. Uh, in the case of natural gas and LNG, uh, to Poland, to India, to Japan, uh, to, to the world over. So the individual that's going to work in this region today uh, and basically manufacturing, we think of it very much as manufacturing, the methane molecule or the ethane molecule, is having implications on society the world over, from the local economy to regional national economy to, to global economy. In, in fact, we think the people of this region, they're basically re redrawing the geopolitical map uh, when it comes to geopolitics and, and how the United States approaches things. So when you're talking about manufacturing, uh, Nick, I want to be clear, and, and, and to all of you listening, uh, I'm talking to Nick DeUlius. He's the CEO of CNX Resources Corporation. Uh, they're on the web, cnx.com, and Nick has his own website, nickdeulius.com, and that his last name is uh, D-E-I-U-L-I-I-S, nickdeulius.com. So when you're talking about manufacturing, though, in the in, you're talking about your own company and how you deploy drill rigs, your reference there, just to be clear, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that 
a lot of the geopolitical or a lot of the geological risk or the geological risk of, of drilling a well has has gone away and the, the now the industry in the shale gas business has gone to your what your reference I, I correct me if I'm wrong is a manufacturing model where you're just you you know that the methane molecules are down there you know how to get them and it's a matter of reducing your cost and getting in and deploying those drill rigs to make it smaller faster lighter denser cheaper to use the title of my 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 fifth book is that is that what you're referring to yeah, the, the title of your book, which was a great book, I had a chance to read it, um, is absolutely applicable to what's going on uh, in natural gas in the Appalachian Basin. If you look at, you can look at sort of E&P and natural gas industry, uh, very centric metrics like well productivity, or you can just simply look at cost. But that transition, that cycling and continuous improvement, we've seen where the cost of providing natural gas has dropped drastically because the efficiencies have grown tremendously. So in many ways, when, when I talk so about I sort of the- So give me an example with CNX. I mean, five years ago, how long would it take you, take you to drill a well? And, and what is it, what's the number of days and what is it today? And when you're looking at even just simple well productivities and uh, the dollar per sort of MCF liberated under a well, uh, the Marcellus has basically seen a tripling of that in a seven to, to 10 year period. And you take that across the entire natural gas space, we've become a victim of our own success. This is exactly what we had hoped for, whether we, we realize that at the start of this or not. When, when you bring disruptive, innovative technology to the fore, and it is as successful as it has been in the case of natural gas, the cost of that widget is going to decline and the supply of that widget is going to go up. And what happens, of course, in the, in the intermediate term is that the demand as it grows for that product is gonna take some time to catch up to supply and the low cost. And you will have periods where supply and demand are not in balance and some painful times for the industry that innovated. So again, we saw that with things like car manufacturing. Once Henry Ford appeared on the scene, at one point in time, there were hundreds of auto manufacturers and now there's a, a, a much lower number, right? We saw it with software. Uh, we saw it with social, we're seeing it with social media. And you're seeing it with natural gas. The, the technology comes to the fore. It completely changes the game board on cost and supply of the product. Demand starts to grow in response to that, but it takes some time for demand, especially for something like demand of natural gas, where you have big capitalization projects that need to occur, like the cracker facility, like electricity uh, generating plants, uh, et cetera, pipelines and so on. It takes some time for that demand to catch up to the supply, but it will if you allow, again, science, engineering, and the free market to dictate uh, where that falls out. Well, let's go back to what you just said about the issue of, of, of victim of your own success. So <clears throat> I, I think it was late last year, and the memory serves, it was Deloitte that estimated that the amount of free cash flow that was lost or destroyed in the upstream shale business in the previous decade in the United States was on the order of three and a half I want to say it's trillion dollars, but maybe that's too much. But three and a half, there were billions of dollars lost. I don't, I'm, 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 I'm struggling to get that number in my head. But that the, 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 as you as you pointed out, that the industry it was in, in 300 billion. That's right. It's 300 billion dollars just was drilled away. Right. That the industry lost that much money because they could they they produced so much uh, gas, so much oil. They 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 weren't profitable. Is, is, are is, is, is that 300 billion? Am I, is that number in the ballpark to your recollection? So a couple of ways to, to look at this, because this is a very important uh, uh, topic, right? This is sure. this is economic uh, reality and, and these are economic endeavors. Um, so first, whenever you've got, again, disruptive technology that, that fundamentally changes things coming on the scene, there is going to be inevitable fallout. That is a, a natural byproduct of that success. And we are seeing that, we have seen that, within the natural gas space. That's to be expected, that's to be welcomed, that's the Darwinian market at play. The biggest beneficiaries of that are the consumers of natural gas and the societies that are building their economies around natural gas. So while there's pain in sort of the, the gas field, so to speak, the manufacturers of natural gas, that is good news, right, for consumers of natural gas and consumers of energy, which is basically everyone. So small business owners, rate payers, economies, societies have benefited greatly. And, and the example I can give you is our home state here of Pennsylvania. 
if you look at Pennsylvania uh, and you look at what the benefits have been to the sort of statewide economy, I think we can look at it from two perspectives. One is from an environmental perspective. Pennsylvania, if you look at a short 12 year period from 2005 to say 2017, uh, natural gas went from about 5% of the electricity grid in state to about 34%, so just over a third. And CO2 dropped 39% across the state. In fact, people don't realize this, but if Pennsylvania was a developed nation of its own, it would be the only developed nation that would have ever met the Paris Climate Accord targets. And it didn't do that because of government policy or government intervention or renewables. It did that because of what natural gas did with respect to growing its share of the Pennsylvania grid and the Pennsylvania economy. Another way of looking at this in state as an example is with respect to tax revenues and tax dollars. So Pennsylvania has an impact fee and an impact fee is basically levied on a per well basis and it tracks and follows as you might expect gas prices and, and production volumes of the well. But since uh, the implementation of the impact fee, which uh, was created in 2012, we're gonna approach this summer as an industry, $2 billion that will be paid into the, the Pennsylvania sort of, I'll call it ecosystem. 60% of that 2 billion goes to local communities where the activity is occurring, the drilling is occurring, and 40% goes to the general budget or the general fund. And that's not including corporate tax, um, payroll tax, et cetera. So, these benefits, right, are sort of superimposed or, or a mirror image of what's going on with some of the pain and the twists and turns that occur uh, with those that are manufacturing the widget, so to speak, or the natural gas producers themselves. So, and it's so an the interesting, pain, so it's the, an so interesting the pain, comparison. The, the, the pain in the drilling sector, uh, nobody's, no, no one's going to hold a bake sale for the oil and gas guys, right? That's not, they're not, they're not very politically popular, but your, your, your overall point is it all, you know, yes, many billions of dollars were lost, but consumers benefited. And that's the way the market should work. Is that your point? Everyone benefited because everyone utilizes carbon, everyone utilizes energy. And it's a very stark contrast to what you see when you net out the math with respect to renewables. So that example that I just laid out when it comes to natural gas and uh, the, the carbon-based uh, side of things, it, it's a stark contrast to what happens when you look at almost opposite policies when it comes to wind and solar, which are sucking up huge amounts of subsidy off the backs, inevitably, indirectly, one way or another, off the backs of those consumers, of those people that use energy, which is all of us, and then either repocketing it into corporations that are looking to, to basically uh, game the system via the subsidy or design themselves to maximize that or, or other entities. So it, it's an interesting contrast in my mind where on one hand, you've got free market, innovation, disruptive technology, bringing to bear a much cheaper, more prolific opportunity via energy and all the benefits that derive from it for everyone outside of that industry that utilizes it, despite the, the, the short-term pain to the industry versus the other side of this, which is you know, the subsidized sort of state mandated model uh, that is costing for sure, right? Hundreds of billions, perhaps trillions, depending on which package and how wide you want to draw your map, uh, that consumers and everyday people in the end are going to end up paying for. And you look at what the, the net benefit is uh, across these, uh, these different sort of metrics, you start to wonder uh, where exactly is the benefit. So back up just one second, because you talked about Pennsylvania as a whole. I I haven't. I didn't check these numbers just today or the last in the last week. But if memory serves, Pennsylvania is now producing something on the order of 20 billion cubic feet a day of gas. Is that in the neighborhood? In Pennsylvania, uh, in total, on an annual basis, is probably producing about seven trillion cubic feet of natural gas uh, a year. Uh, just to put that in context, a trillion cubic feet of natural gas is somewhere around enough energy to heat 15 million homes for a year. Um, and uh, the the export of the 7 trillion, I think Pennsylvania, in terms of its total consumption of natural gas is maybe around 1.6 trillion cubic feet. So we're producing seven and we're only utilizing in state about 1.6. So the net of that would be exported. And again, it's exported to other regions within the United States. It's exported internationally uh, to those countries like Poland and Japan and India. It's exported basically all across the map. Sure, so you, you put it in, in annual figure seven TCF a year. 
um, I, I, I had a, 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 a daily figure, but is, 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 if memory serves, Pennsylvania is producing now more ga natural gas than all, the entire country of Canada. Is that is that right? Yes, and in, in the Appalachian Basin, when you start to include beyond Pennsylvania, uh, northern West Virginia and eastern Ohio, which uh, falls within the basin footprint, uh, the number is even more impressive. Uh, we're sitting basically upon the largest and the lowest cost. So it's one thing to be the largest. That's another thing to be the lowest cost. But to be the largest and the lowest cost uh, sort of feedstock or, or source of, of natural gas in the world uh, is certainly an epic strategic advantage that we would be foolish not to take full advantage of and, and utilize to our benefit, whether us is the United States or the state of Pennsylvania uh, or the, uh, the region here in the Pittsburgh area and Western Pennsylvania itself. So I want to talk about your, uh, I, I just looked on Amazon, you're, you've written a new book called The Leech, um, and that is going to be released uh, next year, I think in January 2022, is that right? Uh, looks like it'll, it'll be towards the end of this year, early next year, but I'll, I'll tell you what I really am thinking through uh, is a way to get that message out um, sooner, so stay tuned on, on timing, but yeah, we're working out the timing of when uh, when the release of that might be. Well, well, let me come back to the book in just a moment, but I want to talk first about you've, you've been you, on your website, nickdeulius.com. You've been writing a lot and posting your your own ideas about the state of the economy. Let's talk about ESG, because one of the things that's been interesting how in, in, in my view is how quickly this environmental, social, and governance uh, call for uh, better environmental, social, and governance uh, rules within corporations has has rocked the, both the financial markets and I would say the oil and gas industry more than any other recent, I don't know what to call it, a social movement, a, a, a financial movement. Give me a, just a very quick rundown of how you see this push for ESG and what uh, Larry Fink at BlackRock has said, we're, we're not going to support any new coal-fired power plants. We're not uh, the bilateral lenders are saying we're not going to invest in hydrocarbon projects. What's your view on this? Because this is something that seems to me in terms of the oil and gas industry in particular is going to be a big issue and maybe the dominant issue for oil and gas producers for a long time to come. How do you see it? Well, as you said, ESG is front and center to a, a lot of uh, a lot of attention in the corporate world, including the energy space, uh, no doubt about it. And ESG is, is another piece of the broader discussion. You know, sometimes it's with respect to sustainability and what that means and what it doesn't mean. Sometimes uh, the social purpose of a business, stakeholder capitalism. We've seen these different terms. ESG is one that's certainly rising to the fore uh, among that group uh, over recent times. And I think there's a, you know, like anything else that's complicated, there is a, a good facet of it. Um, there's a bad facet of it. And frankly, there can be an ugly facet of it. And that's sort of the, uh, the way I think about that and break that down. So on the good side, uh, the good of ESG is that typically when you look at industries and certainly natural gas is an industry that, uh, that this correlates to, the safest and most compliant operators are also the lowest cost and most profitable. So there is certainly a case to be made that good stewardship when it comes to safe operation, environmentally compliant operation, uh, et cetera, correlates to strong financial performance and thus a good investment opportunity. Okay, so that, that is clearly uh, something that we've seen time and time again across a range of industries. Uh, most of them, uh, including manufacturing, energy, uh, th those types of, of, of endeavors. Um, and figuring out um, which one of those entities fits that mold that's a lot of hard work, a lot of details, a lot of constant monitoring, um, and it doesn't lend itself to a quick and easy screening way to assess uh, that, that, sort of, uh, that sort of performance. So when you get into the bad of ESG, it's typically when you take this premise, which is a solid premise of good environmental performance, solid safety performance, good community relations uh, with respect to the areas that you operate within, you know, taking the long view, long-termism versus short-termism, that translates to good investment opportunities. And then trying to boil it down into a very simple, easy to apply formula on a spreadsheet. That's where sort of the bad falls into it. Because when you do that, 
you're basically losing the ability to effectively screen and assess these companies, these entities, these industries, because it's very complicated. It requires constant work uh, to be able to do that. So let when me, you look at big- let me, let me interrupt, Nick, because I, one of the things that it seems, you know, if you say ESG, the good, the bad, and the ugly, the part that to me seems that it's, from what I, I've seen, is that the, 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 one of the defining mechanisms or defining criteria in the whole ESG rubric is uh, CO2. And, and that that more than any other thing is at play. Is that, uh, how, how do you see it? So CO2 is certainly a, a big piece of the E, um, but we can get into to, to CO2 discussions because the, the, the fact of the matter is um, some entities that are deemed to be sort of CO2 friendly or carbon free uh, or, or zero carbon uh, sources, they're not that. They're, they're simply not that. And examples there, of course, are wind and solar, where if you look at the life cycle carbon intensity of wind at scale or solar at scale, it has a tremendous, or they have a tremendous carbon footprint and a, a CO2 impact. But that's looking at across the, the true life cycle versus looking at what the carbon footprint might be at just a point in that development chain. So, so just to interrupt there, because you're, you're saying if you, 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 because I can already hear people hearing that and saying, yeah, you know, he's, you know, again, here's the Ulius talking his book, you're, but you're saying wind and solar, if you count the backup generation that's required behind them and that CO2 footprint or what, how are you, because uh, you, you made kind of a broad statement there. Tell me. Yep. So let's take an example. And I'm, I'm specifically talking uh, to the sort of apples to apples comparison at scale. So if you look at the state of Pennsylvania, uh, Pennsylvania has incentives to look at things like wind power uh, and wind generation. I wouldn't use solar because Pennsylvania is not exactly the sunniest place in the nation. So let, let's make it easier and let's look at wind. If you wanted to replace a, a natural gas combined cycle turbine, say 650 megawatts of, of natural gas fire generation, you would need a couple hundred, you know, two to 300 state-of-the-art large wind turbines to do that, okay? And let's assume that you've got the ridge lines in Pennsylvania to put them uh, in, the, in the locations that they need to be to, to perform uh, in an acceptable manner. That's, there's only so many of those ridge lines, but let's assume that we've got those. To do that type of a, an endeavor when it comes to wind generation to the tune of 650 megawatts and call it 300 turbines, okay, first you have to go mine all the materials that you need to construct the turbines. And most of those materials do not reside in the United States. So the mining of those materials are going to have a tremendous carbon footprint. It's basically surface mining, extractive mining, very carbon intensive. Then you've got to go process all those materials. And typically you're going to process them close to the mining location, which again is typically going to be offshore. That processing is going to be done on the back of carbon. It's going to be carbon powered to get that done. Then you're going to manufacture the facilities and, or I'm sorry, the components. And those manufacturing facilities are going to be powered by carbon. Electricity typically is going to be carbon backed, you know, whether it's in China or whether it's somewhere else. Then you got to ship the components for the turbines to the United States. I, see. I don't care if you're using ships, planes, trains, uh, whatever you're using, carbon based. When you get them here, you've got to clear the trees, you've got to pour the concrete for the pads for these hundreds of turbines, and then you've got to install them, and then you've got to build transmission lines to basically link up all the transmission distribution network okay. yeah, uh, to the system. I'm with you now. And so, then when the wind doesn't blow, you know, to your point, what do you do? Well, the answer is you got to go with something that's instantly reliable. What's that going to be? That's going to be natural gas fire generation. So the carbon footprint on a life cycle basis, and by the way, wind turbines typically have what, a seven to 10 year life before they need to be replaced and recycled or if they can be recycled. The life cycle intensity on a carbon basis of something like wind at scale is tremendously large. It is not quote unquote renewable energy. There is no such thing as, as truly renewable energy. Um, everything at the end of the day has a carbon footprint and the carbon footprint of something like wind at scale, uh, when you look at the realities is quite large. So when you get into ESG and you start talking about CO2, uh, again, the, the easy way of looking at it is to say, well, natural gas fire generation or natural gas itself has a CO2 footprint of this and wind, zero is easy. Let's put zero in for wind. That's, that's quick, that's easy, and that's flawed. And to do the work properly to assess that is a really complicated endeavor. But we do know qualitatively 
the carbon footprint is very large for something like wind or solar. So, okay, good. So I'm, I'm glad to walk through that. And, and, and I, I see your point. And so the good is that you're, you're, you're rewarding performance safe and, 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 and compliant operation. The bad is that you're saying it's, it's, it's uh, the, the, an analyzing what, what fits as what would qualify as good is complex. So what's the ugly? Give me the brief on the, 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 the ugly part of ESG. So what typically will happen in many instances under this type of a, of a situation is that the corporations, and you can pick an industry, let's pick the, the utility industry as, as one in, in specificity here for this discussion. They know that ESG is a concern of investors and they know, I'm sure that uh, the legitimate tangible ESG performance on those measurables like safety and emissions that you can measure and track on a day in and day out basis correlates to, to strong financial performance. But then they also know there's this tremendous attention on it. So what many corporations do and what many companies do is that they turn it into a public relations effort. So what you'll see is you'll see annual reports that uh, the talk and, and sort of the, the happy bromides and the aspirational, um, you'll see pledges that typically have a 10, 15, 20, 25 year horizon to them where the person that's making the pledge probably won't even be working or plan to be working in that position when the time comes due to see if you hit the, hit the target or not. And you start to basically turn it into a big PR effort. And when you do that, that sort of placates in some instances, the investment houses that are trying to make these quick and easy screening decisions. And then you've got other entities that rank these and give awards out uh, for who's the most sustainable or the most ESG friendly in the utility space or the manufacturing space or whatever the case might be. And everything on the surface looks very, very good. So you're get, the, the corporation's getting awards, um, it's passing scrutiny under sort of ESG filters that are quick and easy, and everybody thinks that all is well. And that's exactly what an entity like Pacific Gas and Electric out in California had been doing for years. I mean, they, they were sort of the, the bell of the ESG ball and they were getting awards left and right uh, for all the great things that they were doing and how ESG friendly they were. And then when you look at what was happening underneath all of that, it brought forth a really ugly situation because what was happening was that the utility, so you got that PR effort on one side, you've also got a PUC sitting over it, a public utilities commission sitting over it, that is basically mandating that billions of dollars that used to go into maintenance of grid reliability, those transmission and distribution towers, et cetera, is being reshifted, reallocated to things like charging stations and the promotional efforts for ESG and, and you know, solar, wind, all these other things, right? I see. And what was happening was the infrastructure and the resiliency of that infrastructure was degrading year after year after year to the point where we all know what happened, but what people don't realize uh, beyond the wildfires and, and, uh, and, and the death and the destruction that occurred was that what caused that initial uh, campfire to start was it was a 90 plus year old hook on a transmission tower that broke. And the hook broke 90 some years old, almost a hundred year old hook, and the transmission line fell to the ground, sparked some brush. It was a windy day. And before you know it, um, tragedy on an epic scale ensued. And then you put on top of it uh, what the fallout uh, was with respect to that, these rolling blackouts and looking at the price that's gonna be paid by effectively everyone. Doesn't matter if you're elderly and retired, small business owner, large manufacturer, homeowner, doesn't matter. Everybody's paying the price right now in the PG&E uh, footprint and, and rate base and the bankruptcy that ensued because of it. So what you saw there was what happens when a couple of, of sort of myths come to bear. One is the myth of zero carbon and, and how you can do that on a reliable and on an actual basis. Two is the, the focus on sort of the, the facade of ESG instead of the substance of ESG, you know, sort of running toward what is easier and, and sort of shinier from a promotional perspective instead of the hard day-to-day -day work that good ESG performance demands. And you accumulate that over the course of years uh, to the tune of billions of dollars of capital misallocation, malinvestment, okay? What you get is a situation like PG&E. And what's happened on a macro scale in California is that you took a, a first-rate utility grid and you turn it into a third world utility grid by design, by design. 
Well, let me let me let me let me follow that because it, so if I'm going to paraphrase what you've said, that the ugly is this this too narrow focus on what would qualify and would what satisfy the PR approach or the public facing thing and a, and an uh, inattention to the core of the business and making the business run as well as it possibly can, as safely as it can. Because I I I, I agree with you. This the malinvestment, and I, I would argue one of the reasons for the blackouts in in Texas was massive malinvestment, too much focus on, on wind and solar and not enough on, on resilient and reliable sources of generation. Um, but let's follow up on the net zero part of this because I know you've written about that as well. And I don't know, I can't tell you how many pledges I've seen, <clears throat> excuse me, from, from corporations, from you know, cities that we're gonna be net zero. Um, and, and I want to uh, want to ask you, you know, why, you know, what motivates you on this? But what are the fundamental flaws in this in this thinking about net zero? What you've been you've written about it on your on on NickDeulius.com, and, and said essentially that there's no, you said there's no such thing as zero carbon net zero future. Um, you said this is true for companies, a state, and household. The net zero carbon uh, myth defies science and the laws of thermodynamics. How so? So, you know, we gave the example of, uh, of a company like uh, Pacific Gas and Electric, um, but all of this, and we'll talk through maybe some, some examples beyond companies, but all of this really comes down to, I'm sort of a, a fan of, uh, of, of the literary world, and I'm a big Ernest Hemingway fan. And the last line of uh, The Sun Also Rises is a really famous line in literature, right? His, his last line of the novel uh, was one of the main characters saying, uh, isn't it pretty to think so? Okay, and people always have debated what did he mean by that? And isn't that just a, an epic statement? But, but that line from Hemingway, isn't it pretty to think so? That basically sums up this concept of net zero carbon beautifully. It is a wonderful concept. Unfortunately, it cannot happen. It just cannot happen under the laws of science and, and with engineering. So when you look at net zero pledges, uh, I would go to a couple of comments. One, oftentimes, um, net, right? What does that mean? Like, show me the formula of what net means. When, as soon as I see net, I get a little suspicious about sort of some game and ship going on about, well, I'll take this. It's, it's sort of like in the uh, public company world, I'm not a big fan of um, some financial metrics, but if whenever you hear someone say our, our cash flow is this, but instead they say our adjusted cash flow is this, be on the lookout that, uh oh, why, why do you need to adjust it? Why not just tell us what your cash flow or your your earnings were, why adjusted this or adjusted that? So net uh, makes me suspicious that there's some uh, creative math going on within that network. So, but in the some, end, take- uh, some, some Enron accounting. Um, yes, oh, yeah. Oh, so, I just want, let me interrupt it just one second here because my first book was on Enron and your point about e, uh, ESG and, and Pacific Gas and Electric, just one quick point. It, just in the year that it failed, Enron was the most admired company in America, right? And it right. had been the most admired company in America in Fortune Magazine's rankings for several years in a row, seven or eight years in a row. So here was a company that had a lot of public press, you know, was very praised for all of its operations, and yet they weren't making any money, and <laughs> which was was one came out to be a real problem. But anyway, so you're saying it, back to the Enron accounting around net zero. You're saying you just don't believe that the accounting it will work because they're not the, the the net is the key word there. The net is the key word, and you're being disingenuous when you're doing the carbon uh, ledger, the carbon tabulation. You're only looking at what the wind turbine, let's say, is doing when it's spinning and already installed, and, and not at scale. You're not looking at the true life cycle carbon footprint of that turbine. Because from a CO2 perspective, right, if we're concerned about CO2 levels in the atmosphere, it doesn't matter where the CO2 molecule was emitted from. I mean, the fact that if you put a windmill in, the fact that when the windmill is turning, it may not be emitting carbon or carbon dioxide is irrelevant if prior to that point, you had to emit a tremendous amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere to get it to that point. Um, so take a, a city, uh, we talked about companies, take a city like Boston which is another great example of this. You know, Boston and its leadership is as progressive as it comes when you look at ESG and, and net zero carbon and the like. Uh, so right now, uh, basically Boston, Massachusetts, New England, if you look at New York State, uh, basically have prohibited uh, through various means any pipeline infrastructure that's new from being built 
from the Appalachian Basin, again, the largest lowest cost reserve of natural gas in the world, right next door, into, say, Boston City Gate. And when you we've do that, by, right? And we've seen this, by the way, in New York as well, where Governor Cuomo yes. repeatedly blocked new pipeline capacity into, into Long Island, into the city of New York, um, even though uh, the city mandated a, a move away from fuel oil toward natural gas. So a similar blockade on new pipeline infrastructure. Go ahead, please go ahead. That's right. So why did they do it? Well, they, they applaud themselves uh, with that sort of enlightened leadership because uh, ESG, they'll, they'll hide behind uh, net zero carbon, uh, climate change, um, the, 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 the green future, and, and a zero carbon economy. But the reality today in Boston, I think, is a pretty interesting one. So you stop those pipeline capitalization projects and what we would call infrastructure, ironically, projects from being built. Um, you don't want the natural gas or the methane from the Pennsylvania workers. So what did you end up with in Boston? What you end up with in Boston is, A, uh, you're, getting, you're, you're still using natural gas, and you're getting your natural gas via LNG, liquefied natural gas, is being imported from Russia. So in the dead of winter, when it's freezing cold in Boston, and they need natural gas, basically, to, to keep the lights on and to heat the homes, the LNG tanker that's out in Boston Harbor is coming from Russia. So basically, this policy by design has shunned the Pennsylvania worker right next door in the lower cost form of methane via Pennsylvania and has embraced someone like Putin and someone who, frankly, is not afraid to use energy as a geopolitical weapon. Their supply chain, their supply line for energy development went from a couple hundred miles within its own country to 4,000 plus miles uh, and on the other end of that, right, started with, uh, with someone who strategically views us as the enemy, not, not a friend. And then on top of it, if you're also relying on wind and solar, um, the wind and the solar components, as we discussed, have a tremendous carbon footprint. And on top of it, highly unlikely that they're manufactured in any material way, shape or form in the United States. So strategically, effectively, and from a resiliency and reliability perspective, you have basically turned your back on the closest, um, most like, um, lowest cost, most reliable option and embraced the exact opposite of that. And who's going to pay the price of that? The people and the individuals or the stakeholders that will pay the price are gonna be, again, homeowners, citizens, um, those that are in, in socioeconomic uh, deprived uh, areas within Boston, anything and everything that uses energy. And it's gonna be one of the most regressive taxes that you can imagine. So you can look at this from a company or a corporate perspective in the utility industry and Pacific Gas and Electric, but you can also look at this with respect to government. And we'll just, again, using Boston as an example, but unfortunately, uh, you brought up Texas. Uh, there are many, many examples to choose from that are out there today. And I think Texas and, and what happened there with ERCOT and, and the freeze, Boston, and what will inevitably happen in Boston when it gets really hot in the summer or really cold in the winter, and PG&E in California, I fear that those examples are turning from exceptions into common occurrences across our country. It's, it's interesting you bring that up because just yesterday I was looking at a study that was done uh, by or a survey of commercial and industrial electricity users, and they were commenting, in fact, that they'd seen a, a, a significant decrease in the in the quality of the power that they're getting from the grid, and a, and a higher incidence uh, incidences of outages. That was costing them real money. So there's there the, these knock-on effects that you you mentioned here. I think are really interesting. And I, I just add a quick point there because the one of the things that uh, was talking to a, some Oklahoma cooperatives. Now this is three or four months ago, um, and <clears throat> one of the guys that you know we were talking and he commented. He said, "Well, if you don't have reliability, your affordability goes down the tubes, right? If you don't have reliable energy, then the affordability issue." becomes a real problem when we've seen that here in the in the black in the wake of the blackouts here in texas where solar and battery vendors are saying hey you want reliable power here put solar panels on the roof of your house and get a generator or a battery pack other people are buying generators that's a, a essentially a new tax that's being imposed because of the lack of reliability and in, in, i have a friend of mine is in the utility business in california he's his his co-workers are buying generators because they can't rely they're, they work for the utility and their, their cost of power effectively has gone up dramatically because they can't be sure of reliable grid power. 
anyway, so that's just a quick observation. And, well, the other interesting comparison there too, and jumping back over to Boston on the other coast, many people in New England and the Boston area, right? They, they heat homes in the winter based off of propane or home heating oil. They're, they're the biggest you know, proportional user consumer of that in the entire nation. And to your point, right, just like the, the uh, generator comment with the utility uh, workers in California, that's, that's because of the lack of competence and the unreliability of what's going on with, with Boston and Massachusetts and, and New England's energy policy. So ironically, in the age of 2021, you got a lot of homeowners in New England. They're basically heating their homes very much the same way that Thoreau did when he was writing Walden. And that seems to be ridiculous in 2021. But, but there you go with the unintended consequences and frankly, the reality of how you know, some of these policies uh, that are aimed at, uh, at certain environmental uh, ideologies or, or aspirations end up playing out. I'm, I'm a fan of Joel Kotkin. He's a demographer um, and lives in Los Angeles, writes a lot about uh, class issues in California. And um, uh, it, it, he, he published something recently about the, 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 the big divide in America is, yes, it's left, right, it's blue, red, um, urban, rural. But he said it's a division between the energy producing states and the energy consuming states. Um, and, and, and I want your comment on that, but I also want this I, it, it seems to me as well that there's there's a there's a there's a cultural battle at play here between the and, and I think this is one of the points that you make in in your upcoming book the the leech, um, and the subtitle is a mouthful and I'm going to re read it here, an indictment of the evil sapping America, depleting free enterprise and bleeding producers. Now that's that's a that's a that's a potent title. But it, it seems to me you're in your book, you're addressing this divide, aren't you? I mean, the, this divide between the producers and the consumers, but the consumers want to condemn the producers. It seems to me that there's a there's a cultural battle here that I, I would even frame as the coastal elites. And I don't like that term, but that's how I'm, I'm, I'm increasingly convinced that that's what we're facing. Am I overstating or oh, oh, let me ask the direct question. So <clears throat> is this a culture war? And, and how does your book address this? I think there's definitely a, uh, a war that, that is brewing, and it, it's one that, to your point, it, it's not Democrat, Republican, it's not rich, poor, urban, rural, uh, you know, there's, there's, different, there's different dividing lines that we, we've seen throughout our history. I think the big dividing line today is one group that is what I'll call the doers, right, the, like the producers, the, the, the individuals, the businesses, the people that go out and basically create value. They create value. They take on risk. They create value. They might be fantastically successful. They might be a complete failure, but they're out there creating value each and every day. And they're net contributors, whether it's taxes, whether it's value, uh, whether it's economic growth, they're net contributors to the engine. And then there's a group on the other side that is increasingly growing, that is structured and built upon a growing array and complexity of bureaucracy, rules, regulations, policies, right? Some of them very altruistic in nature, right? They, they sound really good on the surface, but in the end, they're all designed to create complexity that those individuals, entities, and organizations can feed off of. And what you're seeing is a, a net zero sum game where every widget, dollar, GDP point that's created of value by that first group is increasingly being consumed by the second group. So, so, the, just, so just to be clear, let me interrupt. So, is it is it that stark? And is that really what your book is about? The the the, the divide between the doers and the leeches, because so the leech, it's, leech is, a, is a pretty strong label. Yeah, in in, in looking at the, the nature of what's going on, it really is the difference between creating value and appropriating value. So. Again, going to something like uh, environmental policy and um, green subsidy or green mandates or renewable credits, et cetera. And Texas, I think, was a, a wonderful example of this. If left to science and engineering and the free market, okay, you would not see anything that closely resembles what the Texas grid is today, or, or more importantly, where it's heading. Okay, and the reason it's where it's at today and where it's heading, i.e. The, the emphasis and the weighting that it has on wind and solar and the rest, 
is because of rules, regulations, policies, and complexities that were created to allow, for lack of a better term, I call it rent-seeking. And when you look at the rent-seeking, now you've got on top of it, and these are not necessarily small entities or, or individuals. These are very large multi-billion dollar corporations whose entire business model is built off of optimizing off of the regulation or the credit or the subsidy or the mandate. And if you look across our economy and you look across our society, that is a, a very fast growing segment of, of the total to the point where, again, there's only so much value, right? Was it Margaret Thatcher that said at some point socialism fails because you, you run out of other people's money, right? There's only so much that you can reprocess or basically appropriate before you know, things under, under the, the laws of math start to, to not compute and, and collapse. And so, I fear- so, so, so let me interrupt because I, you know, I, we're right about an hour and I don't wanna to go too much over an hour here, Nick. And, and, and just a reminder, I'm talking to Nick DeUlius. He's the CEO of CNX Resources Corporation there on the web at cnx.com. Uh, Nick's own website is nickdeulius.com. Uh, it's Nick, D-E-I-U-L-I-I-S. So let me let me cut to the the, to the end point here because you your book isn't going to come out for several months and it's in, I hear in your tone and, and your argument that there's an there's an anger that if I'm reading you right that is motivated you to to do this right you're you're being very outspoken and and using some frankly some fairly in, in to say inflammatory label but a, a, a very unflattering label the leech. It's not a is not a flattering term. So why did you write the book and why now? I mean, and we can talk about it later when you you know come back on the podcast when the book comes out. But you you're leveling some very strong charges that you don't see out of corporate leaders very often. So you 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 are you going out on a limb here? And why did you write it? It goes back to where we started. Um, and again, I'm I'm writing this definitely from the perspective of a passion. Um, a passion for the, the energy industry, a passion for the region uh, that I'm from, and, and basically a, a passion for the middle class. Uh, I've got a, a love for those groups and, and those entities and anything I can do to support them, promote them, um, protect them, highlight them. I, I think there's a duty to do that. It goes back to what we discussed at the beginning. You, you hear, again, a lot of talk today in the business world, in the corporate world about the social purpose of a business and stakeholder capitalism and you know, the, the need to, uh, to lead uh, beyond sort of profit and loss. And that, I guess, conveniently has been described one way, but I view it a different way. I view it as a duty, an ethical duty to speak truth. And if you've got, as I said, the math or the science or the engineering behind you, or you see what's occurring on a day in and day out basis, it's hurting. Uh, or damaging a region or your customer base or the stakeholders that, uh, that you're there to serve, there's a duty that goes with it uh, to not sort of subscribe to what I used to subscribe to, which is more of, I guess you call it political quietism, and instead uh, to take a, a leadership role and, and, and speak uh, from, from a position of logic and, and rational thought. So there's definitely a passion there uh, with respect to, to what is at stake. And uh, I think energy in many ways is ground zero for a lot of this. I think you see some of this in other industries. Ground, I think you're starting to see this in the tech industry. For, but ground zero for the battle, the ground zero for the, the, the outlook on what society, sh how society should be, sh should be focused. I mean, how do you mean ground zero? So back to your comment about what was it, is one potential dividing line between sort of energy producing states and, and those that consume energy. I think the reason you see a lot of this uh, debate and it centers around the energy industry and, and energy producing states is that those endeavors are largely endeavors of doers. Those are, those are endeavors of producers that are taking on the risk. The workers are, are putting everything they've got into it. Thus, you know, there's, a, there's a tradition and a history and a reality um, that these are the producers of society. And when you look at some of the policies and regulations in situations that increasingly we are finding ourselves in, many of them are designed in some way, shape or form to appropriate uh, that opportunity. And that has big implications, not just in the energy space, but in areas like Western Pennsylvania, where there's a whole generation of kids out there in high school right now, many of which don't wanna go get a four-year college degree. 
And our industry, along with manufacturing, is their best and brightest hope for immediate career and immediate profession with family sustaining uh, jobs and, and wages. So there's a lot at stake here. It's a, it goes beyond uh, just sort of the methane molecule or where you're getting your kilowatt hour from. And that's because energy touches and drives everything that you can imagine in society. So getting it right is paramount. Getting it wrong will be tragic. So I wanna make sure that, uh, that we get it right. And I think energy uh, sort of is one of those pillars under the foundation to make sure that, that this ends up on, on the right side of things. Well, so then what's the cure? Let me, let me finish with this. So we'll have two more questions after this, but what's the cure, Nick? Then you, you've diagnosed the problem and, and your, 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 the, the identification. And I think you're, you know, the, I, I agree with many of the points you're making that the energy issue is fundamental to how America sees itself. And the shale revolution has fundamentally changed America's uh, stance in the world in terms of geopolitics of energy. We've gone from a net energy uh, importer of, or a, a major importer of oil and gas to a major exporter of both of those commodities as well as uh, natural gas liquids. So what's the cure? What, what, you, you, your book, I'm, uh, which I haven't read, but I'm familiar with the title. What's the cure here? What is the, what's the way we go forward? I think first things first, I mean, we have to go back and look at things very logically. So you take something like the climate change discussion and, and debate. That is a very complicated situation with many subtexts and sub issues within it. And I think the most fundamental misunderstanding that's been placed out there and people just accept it that aren't familiar with it is that there is such a thing as truly renewable or zero carbon energy forms of production. I think once people understand what the true carbon footprint is of wind or of solar, what it really means at scale, whether it's for Texas or Boston or California, I think the light bulb, pun intended, will go off in people's heads saying, oh, wait a minute, that is not a truly zero carbon or zero CO2 form of electricity or of energy. Therefore, you know, what is its footprint? And then two, if it's not all that different or maybe in some instances worse than natural gas, higher than natural gas, let's get back to the basics of reliability, resiliency, and affordability of energy. And so, if so we could do that. So you're, so you're arguing we need, a, we need a better understanding of what, well, I guess I'd put it this way. We need a better understanding of where the energy is coming from and what that, what that energy, ba energy balance is. Is that, is that what you're saying? Is that a fair, I'm rephrasing what you said, but it's, um, um, uh, we need a more honest accounting of, what, of where the energy is coming from and what those sunk costs or those, those that the all-in accounting is for those energy forms, land use, in, in resource intensity, et cetera. That's right. If, if, if a Texan or a Californian or a Bostonian thinks or is told that if you can entirely go to wind and solar and the light switch will go on whenever you need it and the cost is going to be as low, if not lower than the alternative, and it's going to be zero carbon, zero CO2 footprint, well, then why wouldn't you be for that, right? But if the reality, if the math and the science dictate almost the exact opposite of that, that the CO2 footprint is quite large. It's not improving the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. The cost net net, when you account for all the subsidies and the shuffling of different credits and whatnot back and forth, that the net cost to your community, to your checkbook, to the society is higher than it was. And that the reliability of that power that is in that energy that is basically the bedrock of everything you'd want to do, whether you're a restaurant owner or you're running a steel plant, the reliability and the resiliency have gone down. Then suddenly a totally different perspective and outlook on, on where you'd want to head. So I think this gets back first and foremost to just facts, rational logic, data, and science. And if you do that, you're going to want some form of an all of the above type of a portfolio of energy uh, you know, creation. And you're going to want things like the free market, ingenuity, innovation to drive advancements and continuous improvement. What we've got right now and what we're talking about in Washington are, are very different than that. And I suspect that that's going to lead to some serious consequences. And to say that they're unintended consequences at this point, based on what we've seen so far in those three examples we've been talking about, I think that's a bit of a stretch. I think at this point, they're sort of morphing into, they should be anticipated consequences versus unintended consequences. Last two things, Nick. Um, so what are you reading? You, uh, you, you obviously, you spend a lot of time 
in your in your job. It's I know it's a, 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 a you're busy, but what do you read when you're not working? You're a fiction guy, nonfiction. I'm both. Um, I got a lot of Bryce on my bookshelves, oh, so uh, yeah, I got I got a few of your 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 work products up there. I, I enjoy them tremendously. Um, also, you know, I've, I've been reading quite a bit, frankly, um, on sort of the classic um, economics and economist side of things. So, whether it's Friedman, uh, Milton Friedman, more recently, or Hayek, or uh, uh, the, the like, I think today they resonate louder than ever. I think it would be a really good exercise, uh, whether it's in high school or college economics courses, or frankly, a lot of our policymakers, uh, to give those individuals a read and a refresh. Because a lot of the things that we're trying right now and some of the paths that we're heading down, uh, they've been tried and, and we've headed down those, or societies have headed down those before, and we know how it ends. So I think that's sort of a, um, a timely uh, um, sort of area of, of study. Sure. Last question then, Nick, uh, what gives you hope? What, what gives me hope, uh, a couple things. One, this, this nation is blessed with an abundance of, of energy innovation, energy resource, uh, energy ingenuity. So when you look at what I call it the potential, right? The potential energy of the energy industry within uh, the United States, it is at an all time high. It's never been higher. And that that people think that I'm anti-wind, anti-solar. I'm, I'm anti-mistruth. So I'm, I'm for wind and solar development as much as any other form of energy uh, that's out there. You're anti-mistruth? Is that what you said? Yes, I'm, I'm anti-mistruth. So uh, was, you know, I'm, I'm against thinking that wind and solar are zero carbon or zero CO2. Uh, I am all for wind and the appropriate applications of it where it makes sense. Or sol Solar in Arizona, to me, seems like a, a good idea. Right, solar in Pennsylvania doesn't make much sense to me. Sure. Um, but so we've got that going for us. We've got a culture of free enterprise. We've got a culture of capitalism, a culture of doing. That's good. And really, if you allow those two things to ferment, really good things are going to happen for this nation because today, again, sitting at an all time high with that first thing, the potential energy of the energy industry, uh, we've got the chance not just to improve our standing and quality of life, but we've got the chance. I think of you ask about well, why write the book and, and the passion. There's billions of poor on the planet Earth that have no access to electricity right now. Uh, they desperately need it. They desperately deserve it. I think the energy industry and things like natural gas can get that to them quicker and cheaper than anything else. Um, there are a lot of geopolitical positioning and saber rattling going on right now. Uh, when I think of the Chinese Communist Party and I think of what's going on in Russia, and how we can help our friends in those neighborhoods like a Poland or an India or a Japan. Uh, nothing can help them more, I think, than the American energy industry. I think it's as big of a geopolitical ever as, a, as an aircraft carrier fleet. I really do. And uh, you start to look at the externality benefits of what this can do uh, on the environmental front when it comes to air quality and, and everything else. Um, I think the potential for us is the best it's ever been. We just have to get it right uh, when it comes to policy. And what I'm thinking through on this and what gives me hope is that these examples that we're running into with Texas and Boston and California, at some point soon, again, I keep using that pun, the light bulb goes off uh, with the American public and we get to a, a more rational position on how we embark on, on energy policy. Good. Well, let's stop there. Uh, uh, my guest, uh, Nick DeUlius, the uh, CEO of CNX Resources Corporation there at cnx.com. He's on the web at nickdeulius.com. His uh, uh, book, The Leech, will be published, I think, in early 2021, or early 2022, rather, uh, or possibly uh, prior to that. But you'll keep us posted on that, won't you, Nick? Stay tuned. Uh, yeah, news to come shortly on that. Okay, good. Well, thanks, Nick uh, uh, DeUlius, for being on the Power Hungry Podcast. Thanks to all you out there in podcast land uh, for tuning in uh, to this episode of the Power Hungry Podcast. Tune in next time for an even, well, I don't know if it'd be even better. We'll hope it's even better than the one today. So thanks again to all of you. Until next time. Mm -hmm.